You know, one of the most interesting aspects about studying ancient Ireland is the apparent lack of documentary evidence uh, relating to people from um, prehistoric times. So, you know, uh, Neolithic, Stone Age, Bronze Age, Iron Age, the, the lead in to the Christian period. Um, we don't have a manual. We don't have a reliable source of documented information that tells us about the people who inhabited the country uh, in prehistory. However, what we do have is we have a huge corpus of myths, legends, folklore, annals, quasi-historical writings, uh, such as the Leber Gabala, the Book of Invasions, that offer a tantalising glimpse into prehistory, or at least give the possibility of a glimpse into prehistory. We can interpret various myths and see that perhaps there is a lot of stuff that originates in prehistory, but we can never be sure. And occasionally when, you know, when we're reading about ancient Ireland, we get a very tantalising glimpse into the past. One such glimpse for me that's very interesting is the writing of Diodorus Siculus, uh, and I'm going to quote uh, from a work that was written in 1830, uh, in the 19th century, uh, and we are talking AD, not BC, uh, by a historian uh, called John Dalton. And uh, this is a work called An Essay on the Ancient History, Religion, Learning, Arts and Government of Ireland. Uh, the reason I'm going to quote from this is because it contains some peculiarities that are really, really fascinating and may relate to uh, research and writing that I've done about the Boyne Valley monuments uh, and possible uh, cosmological connections. Siculus was writing uh, about a mysterious island in the ocean uh, where there was a considerable amount of sun worship. I'm going to read it to you. Um, among the writers of antiquities, Hecatius and some others allege that there is an island in the ocean over against Gaul to the north and not inferior in size to Sicily, that the Hyperborea inhabit it, and that the soil is so rich and fruitful and the climate so congenial that they go there twice in the year. It is affirmed that Latona was born there and that therefore the worship of Apollo is preferred to that of any other god. And as they daily celebrate this deity with songs of praise and worship him with the highest honours, they are considered as peculiarly, peculiarly the priests of Apollo, whose sacred grove and singular temple of round form endowed with many gifts are there. They have a city also consecrated to this divinity. Most of the citizens are harpers who, striking their harps in the temple, sing sacred hymns to the god in which his actions are proclaimed with suitable honour. Their language is that peculiar to the Hyperboreans, and they are attached to the Greeks by a singular affection confirmed from old times. And this is where it gets really interesting. They likewise aver that the moon is so seen from this island that it appears not so distant from the earth and seems to present on its face certain projections like the mountains of our world. Also that the god Apollo himself visits the island once in 19 years, in which space the stars complete their revolutions and return into their old positions. And hence, this cycle of 19 years is called by the Greeks the Great Year. This deity, when he does so appear, is said to sing with the harp at night and to stimulate the dances continually from the vernal equinox to the rising of the Pleiades, delighting himself with the commemoration of his own great actions. And I think the... There are two very, very interesting aspects to that passage for me. 
The first is the reference to the 19 year cycle of the moon. This is what we call the Metonic cycle, which was apparently discovered by a Greek called Meton in the fifth century BC, but which we think are, well, I'm pretty sure, but uh, again, because we don't have documentary evidence except for the carvings on stones at the sites in the Boyne Valley, I'm pretty certain that uh, the ancient astronomers who were involved in the construction of these monuments uh, studied the movements of the moon and knew about the metonic cycle and knew about the uh, saros cycle and knew about um, eclipses happening in patterns and were able to visualize the moon swing uh, the the lunstices the the standstills of the moon over a long period of time um, it's very interesting because on certain curb stones especially one in particular at nouth the so-called calendar stone it was given that name by martin brennan uh, there appear to be uh, calculations which could be, I suppose, interpreted as uh, being um, connected with the study of the Metonic, the 19-year Metonic cycle. In some of his writings, um, General Charles Valency in the 18th century wrote uh, quite a lot about Irish language and quite a lot about Newgrange. And some of it was uh, a little bit... Um, well, it was derided by his peers. Some of it was a little bit uh, speculative. Um, but uh, Valency also said that the 19-year cycle was known in Ireland as the Niachta, which means the 19th, and that this was the uh, the golden uh, cycle. Uh, the other thing that I'm interested in is that, you know, that the moon is seen from this island, that it appears not so distant from the earth and seems to present on its face certain projections like the mountains of our world. Um, one of the things about uh, the movements of the moon and this uh, moon swing cycle that I was talking about, the standstills of the moon, is that uh, the further north, and of course the further south, but we'll, we'll take north for this example, the further north you go from the equator, uh, the greater the distance from sunrise at summer solstice to sunrise at winter solstice uh, so therefore the shorter the day in winter the longer the day in summer in ireland this is quite pronounced in that we have quite short days in the winter sun rises at um, around 9 a.m uh, sets at about 4 p.m in the summer sun rises at around 5 a.m and sets at around 10 p.m and in summer indeed we have this prolonged twilight where in actual fact uh, for about four or five weeks either side of summer solstice on 21st of june the sun doesn't set low enough beneath the horizon uh, for there to be complete darkness and there's this uh, sort of everlasting twilight um, but one of the other things is that the moon because of its standstill its major standstill positions are uh, about five and a quarter degrees further north of the summer sunrise and further south of winter sunrise so the moon rises quite you know at this time in its cycle it rises quite noticeably further north along the horizon than summer solstice sunrise um which means that it's much longer in the sky. But I wonder about this, whether this doesn't refer also to the possibility of some sort of projection of the moon going on with an aperture, uh, some sort of an opening, a hole in a stone, or some sort of a roof box feature in one of the monuments, or something like that. This is pure speculation on my part, where, you know, there was an image of the moon being projected into a place, a dark chamber, uh, and where some of the detail on the moon could perhaps be seen on, on a stone. Now, uh, I'll cast your mind back to, I think it was around the year 2000 or 2001, uh, there was a theory that um, one of the uh, chamber stones at the very rear of the chamber of Nouth's eastern passageway uh, has carvings on it that appear to be a map of the moon. Um, I think the gentleman's name behind that theory was Philip Stook, uh, S-T-O-O-K-E. And that um, uh, there are ref plenty of references to that on the Internet. Um, in fact, at the time, I think uh, a BBC science correspondent uh, visited Nouth uh, and saw the stone for himself. So there are pictures of this. And um, I think Stook was a, a cartographer, a, a planetary cartographer who may have been involved in NASA. 
uh, and uh, he was fairly convinced that this is what this was. So it just had it in mind. I'm, I'm, I'm not sure that the moon appears to be larger from Ireland than it does from any other country. I'm not sure if there's an, any sort of scientific basis for that. But certainly the idea um, that, you know, perhaps some sort of aperture was used to, um, you know, to project the moon like a pinhole camera. You know, a pinhole camera works on the basis uh, that, you know, there's a very f small pinhole in the front of the camera, but that the image is projected onto a quite large space within the camera. And this is the sort of thing that has been done throughout history where images have been projected uh, like that through small openings uh, onto onto uh, large walls. So it's just a possibility. Um, we do know, uh, I think without any doubt, that the people about Newgrange, Nouth and Douth were competent astronomers. Uh, they knew about the, the, the yearly cycle of the sun, but I think also that they studied uh, the sun's motion through the zodiac uh, through heliacal risings, um, through studying the position of the moon, full moon is always roughly opposite the sun. So you can calculate what constellation of the zodiac the sun is if you know what constellation of the zodiac the full moon is in. Um, you know, simple things like in winter time when the sun is low in the sky, the full moon being directly opposite is going to be where the summer sun is. So it's going to be quite high in the sky at night. And conversely, in summer, the sun is high during the day moon is low during the night all of these things would have been immediately obvious uh, could the ancients have worked out the connection between the moon and the tides well plenty of people think so uh, alexander thom uh, suggested as much that in fact that's the sort of knowledge that might have been known since time immemorial long before the monuments of the neolithic were constructed when stone age hunters in the, and gatherers in the mesolithic uh, might have been aware of these sort of things uh, the moon goes through phases, a very obvious one. They knew, for instance, that, you know, there were different periods of the moon. It took X number of days for the moon to arrive back at the same place in the sky when it went round its circuit. But it also took X number of days um, to go from, say, full moon to full moon. And that's what we call the synodic month. So the sidereal month is from the same star background to the same star background again, which is 27 plus days. And um, the synodic month, which is say full moon to full moon is 29 approximate days. And that all of this information or some of it anyway, was carved onto stone in the Boyne Valley um, to record these movements in a way that they I suppose the information could be transmitted and perhaps there was obviously a sacred element to it as well because a lot of the solar and lunar festivals might have been tied up with um, fertility and harvest etc uh, etc et we know that the people who built Newgrange were um, involved in agriculture and uh, that uh, it was agriculture that allowed the monument builders the time uh, to pursue their monumental pursuits um, which you know, t which which was time that they didn't have to devote entirely to hunting and gathering all the time. Anyway, uh, food for thought. Um, the full text of that uh, Dalton essay is available on the internet at uh, archive.org, and it's called "Essay on the Ancient History, Religion, Learning, Arts, and Government of Ireland."